There we go. Thanks. Yvonne, you are muted. Now, can you hear me? Ha -ha. Yes, gotcha. It was great to be here. It was fun to watch people jump on and so many people that I've known. And I just, I just want to acknowledge a lot of the work that I've done is feedback and input from so many of you sitting here in this um, Zoom. I was just like going, oh my goodness, including a really good friend who I went to Puget Sound with um, and swam with. And it was just a few years ago, you know, but um, it's just great to see faces and, and see everybody. So we are really excited to be here. Um, and we decided when uh, Deb asked us to kick this off to do uh, both of us have done kind of a myth busting type of session in other ways and we've put our two sessions together because so often in schools really quickly a practice can become a policy and it's some we've done it for so long then all of a sudden well that's that's the policy that's how you do it you get 30 minutes a week of of therapy services that's the policy but what are really some of the policies? What really should be guiding our professional reasoning? And so that's what we want to do um, today and discuss. And we have lots of information. I know we're going to go a little bit fast, but it's all on the slides and we'll upload the slides in the handout for you. And then because we really want to have some time for some discussion um, at the end. Patty, do you want to add anything? Sorry, I was I was muted there too. So um, no, that that was a great introduction, and I too am very very excited to be here and to see some familiar names that I've grown to know over the um, last well, I guess several years of um, my relationship with the program here. So uh, so thank you, thank thank you for welcoming welcoming us back, and um, we'll get ourselves started. Okay, so we have our objectives here. So if you need to reflect back, but we really wanna take some time and explore some of the myths that we still see crop up um, regarding OT and PT practices within the schools. We also wanna acknowledge that we have um, both done a similar type of presentation with other colleagues and we appreciate their um, input and feedback that has remained in the presentation. And we want to invite you as we're talking to really take some time and think about your practice and um, give yourself grace. Because sometimes when you have a conversation like this, like, oh, I shouldn't have been doing that. Well, but you've done the best you could with the time and information that you've had. And that's part of the, I think, for me, the benefit of um, sessions like this is it gives us an opportunity to reflect on a practice, make some changes, and um, really be able to continue to serve the kids the best that we can. And so um, we also want to encourage you to think about it takes risk to change practice and, and that's okay. Give yourself some um, permission and some time to think about those risks. So we're really hoping that this will help frame your professional reasoning a little bit more in regards to what you're doing within the schools. And that's how we think about what we're doing. And um, we often, within our professional reasoning, really think about our client and um, the context that we're working in and the others that we're working um, with um, very quickly and tactically. And so we're hoping to take a step back and, and reflect a little bit as we're starting the school year, what some of the regulations and policies or professional documents that should be guiding some of our decision-making? What are some of the things that we know what are some of the things that we should bring to the table around our professional reasoning? And we um, really hope too that we're gonna point to some of the professional guidance resources. We will um, upload some additional resources and um, um, practice guidelines and information into the handouts. They might be not be things that we'll be able to um, specifically go over in this session, but things you'll be able to use to reflect further on some of the myths that we're discussing. Um, 
and and it's really important that we are thinking about some of our our professional guidelines that are available from AOTA and APTA. And again, I know we get really busy and we forget about some of that. But Deb brought up the workload um, caseload discussion and how what an honor that your state is getting to have that um, discussion. But there is actually a joint statement between AOTA, APTA, and ASHA that provides some guidance from our professional organizations on workload caseload. And we'll make sure we put that in the handout um, um, link for you guys as well. But um, those kinds of things are important to stay um, current on and have available in your toolbox as you're making decisions. Two types of professional guidance that we have available to us are, Deb mentioned the quality indicators for OT, and then PT has competency guidelines that were developed by um, Susan Efkin. And um, PT actually has taken those competency guidelines and put them into a professional development resource um, that's available on the APTA website. But these are really great resources to help guide some of your decision making in the schools and some of what guided us as we develop some of these myths. So um, really, we want to encourage you and we're going to point you to some of the resources to know what um, you can use and what is used regarding some of our decision making in the schools. And even though we have a variety of things, sometimes we still struggle to really find um, relevant practical um, evidence that guides our practice. And so what we're hoping we've done is kind of put some things together in a little package to help you with um, so, some of that. And I think part of the reason why we are particularly concerned about um, how we uh, how we approach the myths of our service delivery and how we approach opportunities for growth and change in our practice is that there really is this pretty significant gap between what we know about our research, our practice policy, and our um, our professional resource, and what we actually use in practice. And, and these gaps have really significant negative impacts in terms of our service delivery outcomes, even the satisfaction that um, our, our students, our teachers, and their families feel, and our own sense of professional credibility and, and satisfaction with our role. So we, we approach this work from the perspective of how can we create a better match? How can we really work to close that gap? So we know um, that in order to close that gap, when we need a lot of the kind of resource that we're going to introduce today and, and sort of talk about. But when we do that, our, obviously our, the effectiveness of the work that we do improves. Um, we, get, we are able to more effectively reach the, um, the student progress and the outcomes that we're kind of setting for ourselves. That one of the things that always is really intentful and important to me is that everybody stays in the right roles. Um, we empower our students to participate effectively in the roles that they need and want to do. The teachers stay in their effective roles and we stay in ours. And, and we all feel more satisfied with the very work that we're doing and the contributions that we are making. So, you know, so what does this mean for us? We know that, um, that having, uh, you know, kind of approaching this perspective of understanding and breaking down these myths from an evidence-based practice is, is critically important, um, but it kind of goes beyond that, it goes beyond just having information literacy. We need to be able to, uh, to take all of those bits and pieces. And, and if you think back to the diagram that Yvonne showed earlier, that's the integration of a lot of pieces of information that we try to store in our working memory and somehow keep current around what's in the literature, what's in the science, what's in our professional resources, and how do we, how do we um, sort of capture that and integrate it all with our knowledge of state and federal legislation. So we recognize that it's a work in progress and a really huge um, commitment that we make on a moment to moment basis to do that. Um, so we know, you know, again, we, we want to begin to sort of demystify some of the 
the experiences that we have in schools and in school related practice by not only being information literate and able to look at the evidence and translate it, but we want to know how can we how can we incorporate this information in the context of emerging practices, um, utilizing some of the promising practices that maybe we need, particularly sound um, database decision making. We need to sort of again objectify those observations and and figure out how to rethink um, a little bit about what we're doing so that what, what we are sort of accustomed to and used to doing and do simply because it's the stuff we've always done, how we make that shift from um, of, of changing our practice to meet those uh, the, that new information and those new standards. So we wanna really make those shifts in thinking about um, practice from the perspective of what's on the horizon versus what have we just always been doing. So I think this is just a, you know, a reminder, the purposes of IDEA is to making sure that children with disabilities have access to a free and appropriate public education. It really emphasizes the special education and related services that they need to prepare them for future education, employment, and independent living. Um, we, we know that the underlying purpose of IDEA is to ensure that students and children, um, children have that, those opportunities and that their rights are protected. So, um, so if we're on the same page about that underlying purpose, that begins to provide for us a really solid foundation for demystifying and debunking the myths I think that sometimes we we have adopted. So a little um, sort of history, I guess, lesson of what practice looked like in the schools compared to now. You know, think back and, you know, I've been in school practice for many, many, many years. So the then feels real, real to me, um, where therapy was occurred in a therapy room, right? We did a lot of standardized testing and got that standard score. Um, we developed our discipline specific goals. And from my practice lens, I did a lot of motor focus to the kinds of interventions that um, that are that were being provided. Versus now, therapy services are provided in context, in the places where our students are, are living, are playing, are eating, are learning. Um, and we're using a lot of performance-based evaluation assessment of students. So looking at what are those functional deficits that are really impacting their ability to access and benefit from their educational experience. We've shifted away from the very discipline-specific goals to now working with our teams to come up with collaborative goals that focus on those unique priorities for, um, for the students and then looking explicitly at how they are able to participate in roles and routines that are of value to them, um, things that they need and want and are expected to do. So we've seen a, a pretty dramatic shift in the, in the kind of the focus of service delivery um, over a relatively short period of time. So some um, special education issues for consideration. Um, the this is really not meant to be an ex, a, you know kind of an exclusive list. I think that we could probably together as a group come up with many many more um, special education issues that have have bubbled up. But we think that these are perhaps some of the main uh, um, areas around which myths have formed in uh, the way that we approach. Um, service delivery. So obviously access to an opportunity to progress in the general education curriculum, finding ways to meet the needs of all of our students through universal design um, and, in, and, and engagement, participation of regular education teachers and regular education curricula for our students and making sure that students have those opportunities to engage. Um, the clear documentation of supports that are needed. Um, so thinking about 
you know, kind of moving away from that sort of qualification perspective to thinking about what are those needs? How are we prioritizing them? And how are we effectively working with educators to serve um, uh, the array of needs that students bring to us? Um, increasing student and parent participation. So thinking less about, um, you know, uh, providing that service too, but empowering students and, and, and family members and even teachers to participate in. Um, more focused planning with our teams. That's been, a, a, I think, a, a huge um, effort and commitment uh, for many of us to be reframing what the issues look like. Stronger performance, we want to really think about the high achievement opportunities and standards for all students. Um, and, then, and then certainly greater personal involvement and commitment to the results of the, the, um, that students are making. This is a big one for me because I think it's sometimes hard to really talk to our teams about what is the unique contribution that we as OTs and PTs are making to those achievement outcomes for our students. And then certainly stronger relationships between home and school. The little silver lining in the pandemic has empowered us to build those, have opportunities to build stronger relationships with home. And that's been, I think, a really nice um, opportunity. So just, uh, just to, to get us to a place where we're gonna embark on these myths, um, it's easy to develop and accept them, particularly when we um, when we have when we lack access to the right kind of evidence and the right kind of professional documents that enable us to be effective in our schools. So let's get started on these myths. All right. <clears throat> So, and, and I should say too, as we were talking, we were like, oh, well, we should add this, we should do this. So, you know, we have an hour, we could spend a whole day exploring and um, thinking about some of the myths that we um, accept. So um, if one of the myths that you've thought about isn't on here, um, maybe that can be something we can collect a little bit of a list of in the chat or something at the end, and we can work on pulling some additional resources together too. But you must qualify for occupational and physical therapy in the schools. Um, and the big thing with this myth is this word qualify. And so um, really looking at IDEA, um, there is no such thing as qualifying for OT and PT in the schools. Um, they don't use that word at all. They do talk that the related services are required, that the students should get any related service required to assist a student who's eligible for special education to benefit from that education or that's necessary. So we um, really encourage people to not use the word qualify in their reports, but that you recommend services and you recommend it based on what that um, student needs in order to, to um, benefit from their special education program. Um, some other guiding principles around this myth are um, free and appropriate public education or being in that least restrictive environment or access to general education. We need to make sure that we're not um, removing a student from their educational program for therapy services that maybe are not necessary for them to benefit from that therapy program. Um, and this is consistent with, with our um, professional standards as well. And to really be talking about the process we need to go through to determine need. And, and then um, Michael G. and Greco has done quite a bit of research around related services. And it's really interesting. His research is actually, um, some would say dated, but I, because he did it back in the um, 90s, but I would say it's still very relevant for, um, for a lot of what we talk about and a lot of the work that we're still doing in the schools. Uh, one of the articles that we'll put in the handout for you is one that he's written on program and placement and services and really talks about knowing um, a student's program and placement prior to making a recommendation of our services actually leads to better outcomes for the student. If we make a determination of how much OT or PT services a student should know should have before knowing their program and placement, um, I believe, now I'm going off my memory, but in his research, he found that students were over or underserved more than 50% of the time. 
So um, some really compelling research on um, thinking about it's not necessarily that it's a number that qualifies a student for our services on a standardized test as much as it is using that standardized test to inform our professional reasoning and what does that what's necessary for that student to benefit from their special education. Yeah, so I, we have a um oh oh Patty I see you just answered it. We had a question in the uh chat about what are non-mandated mandated uh services. So oh, okay. Um and so related, so here's here's the different types of services that we can we provide in the school defined by IDEA. And so again, we really encourage people to use this language as much as possible. Um, and in some in some districts we've worked with or some systems we've worked with, they're still talking a lot about push in and pull out services. That describes what our what what we might be doing um, as far as when we're working with the child, but really um, as we're talking in our in our reports and our professional documents, staying as true as we can to the IDEA language helps with this. Um, here's just some different professional guidelines and resources that are available to us that help uh, define and guide some of our decision making and. And being able to, if somebody says, well, I think that this sh student should have X, Y, or Z, and being able to reflect on how we've used the PT competencies for school-based practice to guide some of that decision-making um, helps allow for increased um, confidence in some of the professional reasoning we're um, doing. Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. And then again, here's, here's the... Um, picture of the um, article, Interactions Among Program Placement and Services, what some of the research that supports some of this. All of Michael G. and Greco's, almost all of his work now is available on this um, University of Vermont website. So um, if you're not familiar with some of his work, we encourage you to go and read some of that. He had a large federal grant looking at related services in the schools with some very um, relevant information to guide some of our decision making. So our second myth that we wanted to talk about, one that I, I he hear from clinicians a lot, um, is that occupational physical therapists must use standardized tests to determine student need in the school. And so similarly, IDEA um, does not have explicit language about the use of standardized assessment. What they talk about is that we, um, local education, um, agencies must um, make sure that assessment tools and strategies um, are that provide relevant information that directly assists the person in determining the educational needs of the student that are provided. And so we there isn't there is not language that we have to provide um, standardized assessments that you know get us to a certain standard deviation or what have that kind of language does not exist in um, IDEA. Instead, it really guides us to be thinking about what is the relevant information that we need to provide the team in order to effectively make those decisions. And so we know from our own professional standards that we have a lot of important guidance that can help us think about what are the best ways that we can capture and provide for the team the information that will be able to help make decisions. We can complete that occupational profile as OTs and conduct an analysis of occupational performance. And similarly, from a PT perspective, completing the systems review and analyzing the performance again, that is going to make the most sense and empower teams to make those relevant decisions. Um, and, and then from a research perspective, what we know what the, the literature is telling us is that the closer that we get to informing the team about students' strengths, needs, and barriers to access really can help make a difference in helping the team prioritizing those specific needs for uh, the students. And and I mean, this, the second bullet here is, is like sort of, um, no brainer, right? The the our in our outcomes improve when we are able to really identify precisely what those 
uh, relevant areas of information are and promote that in terms of the prioritization of um, goals and outcomes for our students. So, um, so we know, and again, this, uh, this, this data comes from uh, a multidisciplinary perspective, um, uh, although I, you know, I, I'm speaking from an OT lens, um, but we know that evaluations for related services are more effective when they are top down, right? When we know we're looking at that student's performance from a participatory perspective, and then, um, and then sort of drilling down to identifying what is the most um, important and most highly prioritized outcome for this student. And when those assessments are conducted in the least restrictive and natural environment. So what are those occupation or participatory components that are successful for the student? Where are they succeeding? Where are they problematic? Where are the barriers? And when we approach assessment in that way, versus relying on a specific standardized assessment in, um, you know, in, in, in absence of all of those other sort of contextualized pieces of data, we will, um, we, we, we achieve a better outcome. Um, and, and then ultimately needing to focus on the barriers to learning and participation in order to, um, again, to sort of promote that, those important outcomes. So what context, so I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot that these are all uh, blending in like this. So um, yeah. what context are we uh, supporting and inhibiting in engagement? And it's, come on. It's not, there we go. Um, no. And so I think if we reframe our, um, our, our reliance on that standardized data, and instead answer these following questions in our, um, in our assessment processes, we get closer to the intent of the uh, language in IDEA. So what are the student's strengths and needs? How um, are those needs affecting educational performance? How are they influencing their participation? And how can we make sure that the services that we're providing are facilitating their, the student's performance in the context of the activities that they want, need, and are expected to do in their day-to-day -day routines. And I would just want to add here too, we're not saying that you shouldn't use standardized tests, but we're just saying it shouldn't be, it doesn't necessarily have to be the primary first go-to because sometimes some of the standardized tools that we have available to us don't help us answer these questions. And, and so they tell us how, um, how delayed that student might be compared to the norm. But it, just because a student has a delay doesn't mean that it uh, impacts their educational um, performance. Or likewise, a student may on a standardized test demonstrate a very small delay, but have a huge impact on educational performance within the classroom. And so um, knowing that IDEA language and really emphasizing, it says tools and strategies. So some of our strategies like skilled observation and interview and looking at work samples or you know all those other things we do may help us better answer some of these questions. Oops. Um, so I, and, and I think one other point that I wanna make is just that, um, we really need to link assessment data with student performance and participation. So even when we do use, and, and just as Yvonne said, even when we do use um, uh, standardized data, we have to link it. And one of the challenges I think that we can um, find ourselves in is that we can, um, you, there can be inconsistencies in that data, right? So you could be seeing something, a student functioning really well, and then having a, a low score in one area or another, the key is we have to link that assessment data with student performance and participation and making sure that all of the data, whether that be standardized, whether that be formative, whether that be observational, whatever that is, that it has to be connected, it has to be linking um, and linking explicitly to that 
participatory information or performance in the classroom. So um, yeah, so those are, thanks for bringing that up, um, Yvonne. And then the, the kind of the last point that um, to make here is that we know, and I and I alluded to this earlier, that um, that when when we have really good explicit data that's linked to performance and participation, and we really prioritize and think about how our own um, service delivery is going to relate to that evaluative data, it becomes really obvious and. Um, and we've already laid a foundation about when services will no longer be needed. So I think it, the better we are, um, are producing good, solid, evaluative information at the outset, the clearer and easier it is to dismiss students from therapy services when our services are no longer needed. So what our research offers us, obviously, is an array of um, data about the reliability and validity of our tools. We can look at that very, very explicitly and make sure that the tools that we're using with our students make sense given um, the conditions or challenges that they're experiencing in school. And they can also offer some objectivity for the evaluation methods that we are using, again, whether those are standardized measures or whether those are other kinds of observational and, um, and uh, informal strategies to, to gather information. And one of the pieces we didn't um, add, layer into all of this, but is another piece to consider is some of the legal um, cases that help inform some of our decision making and um, the PT guidelines for school based practice. Um, it's a green book has they've done a really nice job of pulling some of those court cases that can help some of your professional reasoning. But if some of you have been in school based practice for a while, you may have re you may remember that Florida, the state of Florida used, used to have what they call the cert. And they actually use standardized scores to determine if a student would get OT or PT services and how much services. They're no longer using that tool because um, parents took um, issue with it. It ended up going to court and it was found that it, well, that that type of activity saying that this standardized score means that you get this um, is not consistent with IDEA. So um, layering some of the those legal pieces in can be really helpful um, as well, and which would be a whole nother talk. <laughs> so but um, something to be thinking about. So myth number three, occupational and physical therapy can only address motor in the schools. I want to, I'll just say right now, I think OT and PT in the schools are some of the best kept secrets. And if, if schools really got a grasp of what we as OT and PTs um, could do to help with student performance, we would be so busy. Um, but um, IDEA really defines OT and PT services. It does not limit us to just motor. Um, and it talks about that we um, really should be using, it's, it's in alignment with, with our professional standards and our professional standards um, even speaks to a whole lot more that we do as OTs and PTs um, and the research as well. Um, for example, and we, well, I'll hit this in a minute, but there's a whole lot of research that talks about um, ways of teaching, ways of supporting um, posture, how much posture has to do with um, engagement in school, uh, heavy work or, you know, weightlifting, some of those uh, movement activities, how it helps with behavior. Uh, but are PTs involved with some of the behavior discussions for some of the our kiddos in the school? Some, all of those different pieces, um, and looking at skills, habits, and routines, and how and where we can step in to support a student being um, successful. The importance of recess and free play for being able to come back and being ready to learn, and so are students able to um, access some of those environments, not just from a motor standpoint, but from a social, the, the whole psychosocial component to recess as well. 
Um, so therapy um, services should be looking at improving, developing, and restoring functions, but also improving ability to perform tasks for um, independent functioning. Going back to that purpose of IDEA, and we're preparing students for further education and independent living and work. And so we should be thinking um, about some of that, as well as preventing through early intervention, initial or further impairment or loss. So this is how they talk about our services within um, IDEA. And so are we thinking about some of that as we're designing and thinking about some of the um, the uh, where we're going to step in on the IEP and support some of students' participation? Again, this isn't inclusive, but we were just talking and brainstorming. Well, student performance, um, activities of daily living, so caring for their basic needs of school, toileting, managing their shoes, dressing up and down for PE, using transportation, getting on and off the um, bus, all those things, um, making sure that we're thinking about that. And again, not just from a motor perspective, but from psychosocial perspective or from an accommodations adaptations or barriers within the school environment, um, thinking about education. And again, IDEA is very clear that it includes academic as well as non-academic and then those pre-vocational and vocational activities. So are we thinking about um, before and after school activities? Are we thinking about ensuring that the students we work with are able to participate in school dances? Um, yes. I remember, um, I worked at a high school that is built on a hill, so it has uh, it, and it had half half stories. It, it's it's just very unique. Anyway, and so we had some elevators, but they had the school dance, but they disabled all the elevators during the school dance, and pictures was on a different floor than where the dance was. And so as as OTs and PTs, are we asking some of the questions and helping increase some of the awareness in, so that our students are able to participate in the different activities happening within that educational setting? Um, behavior, um, including being able to stay on task and self-regulation. And again, emerging evidence, lots of research coming out around heavy work. It's not an accident that there's um, weightlifting gyms and prisons because we know that a lot of that heavy work can help with some of that behavior regulation. Um, there's emerging evidence coming out around play and leisure um, and leisure in preparation for pre-voke and future activities outside of um, school. We know that leisure is part of that transition IEP, but be even being able to think about it earlier. Um, and some of that emerging evidence is on Susan Basic's website of Every um, Moment Counts, and she's really building out some of that leisure side of that website, and that is worth going in and looking at what um, she's finding out and thinking about social participation. Um, and again, including those extracurricular uh, activities. And I've mentioned some of the research, but we we know the um, there's emerging research on um, the importance of some of those brain breaks for that does include movement, but that it increases attention and learning. And um, some of the data that I've read that's starting to come out is just transitioning from one class section to another. That's not a brain break. It's it, it, they need to actually have a time that they can. Uh, students can actually have a break from their brain having to be engaged and everything more kind of free thinking, free play types of things. Um, having appropriate recess activities available to support school engagement, um, appropriate positioning to support self-regulation and, and learning. There's so many other things that we should be thinking about um, within the context of what we're doing with a student. And of course, it's not saying that we don't think that we don't do motor, but motor is shouldn't be um, the all inclusive um, piece of what we're looking at for student participation. So um, the next area that we thought uh, to take some time to talk about is the idea that OTs and PTs must have their own goals and objectives on the IEP. So, um, so we've come a long way in this particular area, but, but we still have a lot of concerns and questions that arise from time to time. And um, 
And, and while we know that the goals and objectives are collaboratively developed by the IEP, um, changes within them are made again by the whole IEP team. And that and the and the the idea behind the goals that we're writing on the IEP is that they are really those outcome expectations that we're we're developing, as opposed to how are we designing and establishing the interventions that we are going to incorporate over the course of that uh, period of time of, of that that IEP has been developed for. Um, and so we know that um, what we uh, what, what we kind of what seems to support our decision making and the implementation of effective planning is when we develop an intervention plan that sits separate from that IEP. Um, we need we need those IEP goals again to understand explicitly what those outcomes are. But that intervention plan, that sort of thinking behind how we're going to implement and work toward those goals can be part of that intervention plan that is developed. In, in both cases, we know that the more we collaborate with our team, the better the outcome. So IDEA says that obviously what is included in that IEP are um, is is what that outcome is going to look like as we implement specially designed instruction. So that are those pieces adapting the content. What is the methodology? How are we delivering that um, instruction to meet the needs of the student? Um, and we also know explicitly that that we're related services providers. We can. Um, it, look at an array of services that are essentially required to help um, that student benefit from that specialized instruction. So our service delivery can fall within a, an array of service delivery options um, across the range from services that are provided within the education setting, um, supplementary um, aid, supplementary services, accommodations and modifications to the curriculum. So again, the goal that we write into the IEP talks about what that outcome is, what we are doing in the development of an I, of a, of a um, intervention plan or plan of care talks about how we're going to get there. It's that map that we're going to do in order to get to um, that particular outcome. So the IEP includes things like um, what the student needs to do in order to advance appropriately toward those goals that we set, how we're going to involve them in the um, general education curriculum, what kinds of activities, extracurricular, extracurricular or non-academic activities that they might be able to participate in, and how they're going to be educated both within the context of the curriculum, as well as with uh, the other students that are in their classrooms. Um, so the, that statement is very, very explicit and focused toward that educational outcome for them. Our professional guidance, um, on the other hand, talks about making sure we have a good map to get to those particular outcomes. And the map in our, uh, across our disciplines, our intervention plans or plans of care, talk about again, how those services are gonna be delivered. So it's that, um, again, that process that we're gonna use to get to those particular outcomes. So the intervention plan or plan of care is a written statement along with the data that we are going to collect and what we're gonna to use to develop that intervention plan and the data that we're gonna collect, that's gonna help us make informed decisions about the therapy interventions that we are putting in place. Um, it's separate. It's, um, it's the way that we are kind of organizing that, that process to get there. It's very, very flexible. It doesn't require that the team come back to the table each and every time we make some adjustments to that, um, that planning for how we're going to provide the service delivery, um, or not the service delivery, but the interventions within that context. So the IEP, again, um, that is the 
It's a part of the process that's mandated by IDEA. It identifies the, it identifies the goals and objectives, and it specifies specifically what the instruction is going to look like. Um, how is that going to um, be prioritized for, uh, for the students? The intervention plan, the plan of care, it's part of the process, but it is um, that tool that is uniquely designed and, and based upon our guidance documents. It directs our actions. And I guess, uh, you know, I keep using the idea of a roadmap because in my mind, it that's what it is. It's how we are going to get there, what we are going to uniquely do as a discipline to support that particular outcome. Um, it identifies the therapy approaches, the types of interventions that we're going to use to get to that particular outcome. There are similarities, as you can see in this Venn diagram, but they are also uniquely different um, in that the IEP is collaboratively developed and prioritized by the IEP team. It's usually focused, again, what are those outcomes that we are hoping to achieve by the time our students, um, by the time that IEP period is completed and the intervention plan is a flexible roadmap developed by ourselves for the purposes of guiding our unique interventions that we're providing. So um, again, it's the plan that directs our actions. It also can help us document um, what those intervention strategies are um, and make the links to what's available in our literature. So it can help us really frame um, how we're using evidence to support the work that we're doing with um, our students. And um, it I can identify our intervention goals and, um, and link those activities specifically to the student performance outcomes. It's easily modified. You don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to come back to the table unless you're changing um, a goal, unless you're changing a specific outcome. You can, the, the intervention plan is a lot more flexible um, than that intervention, than the IEP. Um, and it considers those outcomes and how we bring our unique um, expertise to that particular um, plan for the student. Okay, so myth number five, um, occupational and physical therapy services are delivered in the therapy room. And I just want to, um, we we put this caution in because people <laughs> have said, oh, Yvonne and Patty say we should never be pulling out, we should never do one-on-one. -on -one. And that is not um, our intent at all. But we do think that we should um, change change our default. Um, and that um, where we tend to default to one-on-one -on -one and pulling out into therapy rooms, that we should think about our services in context first. And again, as IDEA says, only be as specialized as necessary. So we only go to the therapy room when necessary, or maybe sometimes for short periods of um, time. Um, and this is also consistent with the LRE, that we should be providing our services in that least restrictive environment. And I think... Um, Sometimes it's harder to have to get outside of our comfort zone of that therapy room. But I also feel like when I've been able to be more in context, I'm able to provide services that are more relevant to that student's, um, what that student encounters in their day-to-day -day, um, existence in the school environment. Um, again, both of our professional standards, OT and PT, talk about um, working with our client who's that individual with the disability, but they also talk about the importance of our services to the organization or at a systems or population level. And um, we may be working really hard to quote unquote, fix something with a student with a disability when in reality, the um, what's making the the student have difficulties is the way the system's set up. And so we need to be thinking about that school environment and getting into the context. Um, you know, a teacher, a common one for me because I do quite a bit of sensory um, work and consultation in the schools right now is, you know, a teacher is like, well, he's always disorganized and he's so confusing. And I walk into the classroom and the classroom 
The physical environment of the classroom is disorganized and confusing and there's stuff everywhere. And I have sometimes have a hard time being um, focused. And so thinking about this, the, the context that the, we're asking these students to function within and, and bringing our lens in to have some discussion around that. Um, also looking at some of the research that's out. Um, again, some of this research, Jean Greco and some of the work that Rainforth and York have done is, is what some people would say oh, is older, but it's very grounding and very um, important and still very relevant to, uh, to what we're encountering um, today. Um, students should be educated in that least restrictive environment to the maximum extent possible. And we should only remove them from general ed when it's necessary. So we need to be really thinking about that in terms of our therapy services as well. What should it look like? What can we do? Um, I've been having some discussion with a team that I'm working with right now. Uh, it's a student with autism that has a one-on-one -on -one para. So how much do they really need additional one-on-one -on -one from some of our other related services compared to the other related services providing support to the para and then the para can continue to provide some of those other um, supports directly to the student. Those are all things that we should be talking about instead of automatically defaulting to, okay, the student has these delays, so I'm gonna, pro I'm gonna provide those direct hands-on. Um, so only as specialized as necessary is in the law. So we need to be looking at educationally relevant. You know, sometimes I have parents who are like, oh, but I, he would so benefit from having time from you. And um, I just sometimes blame, <laughs> excuse me, blame some of my professional reasoning on the law. I would love to work one-on-one -on -one with your student, but IDEA tells me that I can only be as specialized as necessary. So I can't automatically pull your student out unless it's required. And so, and and I, it's IDEA, IDEA's fault, right? And so that's where using some of these documents can help us in some of our um, discussions. Um, Again, as you saw when we talked about assessment, service delivery as well should relate directly to their IEP, should build upon their strengths, minimize their needs. We think need to think about keeping in that least restrictive environment and be portable. We should be working on skills that they use across um, therapy contexts. So I just noticed that my computer's about ready to die. There we go. Um, so we must link our services with student performance and participation in the classroom as well as other school contexts. Um, and the other thing that I talk a lot about, and I think I did a whole ties presentation on this, so we might be able to find this and um, link it for you guys, but I talk about we need to just flip our service delivery. So instead of um, system supports and information sharing accommodations being the, the last that we think about, flip this triangle upside down so that we're, we're starting thinking about system supports and accommodations and supporting um, so that the student is, needs are being addressed throughout their school day, not just during hands-on um, OT or PT services. And, and then we get to that direct hands-on, maybe we need to prepare a skill or maybe we need to work on something that's really specialized. And we certainly want to do that. But um, as soon as that student has that skill, we need to get them back into the school context to practice and continue to build that um, skill. And so our uh, final myth, although again, um, certainly not all inclusive of all of the myths that are out there um, is that occupational and physical therapy uh, practitioners cannot provide MTSS or RTI services. And, um, and just as a reminder, if you wanna post in the chat any other myths that you think that are kind of floating out there that we can help bust um, after we uh, tidy up our list here, we're, we're happy to do that. So, um, so this myth is, um, I, I think that we're starting to gain a better understanding and, and Yvonne alluded to this by uh, talking about sort of flipping the triangle, right? Um, that we can provide for services who do not have an IEP 
um, in order to receive that I idea of incidental benefit from services being provided. Um, so we can think about those systems that we are, are uh, providing services to. We can think about our client as system, our client as um, the population for for example, the whole school district. So maybe, um, you know, really framing this idea about how are we making sure that our expertise enables us to reach all students. So we can do that through some of those systems and MTSS uh, frameworks that, um, that we have available to us. Um, so we know in terms of our professional standards that OT and PT practitioners are included on the list of specialized instructional support personnel that's um, written into the um, Every Student Succeeds Act in order to provide multi-tiered systems of support to general education students. That is written into that law and um, we are able to provide that in that context. And once again, we, from our literature, from our research, we know that when we provide service delivery across that full range of our services, both in mandated and, and or MTSS and RTI service delivery structures, outcomes of students improve um, across the board, not just those that are identified with, um, with needing special education services. So um, we wanna leave some time for questions. I know we have just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna hit these last few slides really quick and then we'll have some time for discussion. I just wanna say we will capture the chat. We will um, pull some additional resources um, and some of the things that we've mentioned when we've answered questions and put them in the handout folder. Give us a few days, but by the end of the week, we'll have a lot of that um, available for you. Um, but what do we need to do? We need to make sure that we're practicing in according to IDEA and our professional standards and research. So come up with a strategy to stay current on um, some of that. You all have Echo Ties. I think it's a great resource of um, helping you stay current. And don't forget to go back and look at some of the past Echo Ties um, presentations because um, there's some really useful information in there. And then be willing to... Um, I was talking with a colleague a long time ago and I told him, I hate, Gordy, I hate conflict. I'm just gonna put my head down and do my own thing, but I hate conflict. And he's like, Yvonne, change won't happen if you're not willing to respectfully engage in a challenging conversation. So I've removed conflict from my language and I respectfully engage in challenging conversations. And I usually start it with, my administrator would hate it. I'd walk in and I'd go, I'm kind of puzzled. And he'd go, all right. What do we need to talk about now? But it's different things to kind of, for me, because I don't like confrontation, but be ready to reconceptualize what therapy services can look like and do in the schools. I'm so excited that you guys are having that conversation on caseload and workload. That is a great way of um, reconceptualizing what we do in the schools and kind of getting, helping others, not just us as OTs and PTs, but other members of the team to also reconceptualize that we're more than just a hands-on direct 30 minutes a week, one time person for that student to see, but there's so much more we have to offer. Find ways to get involved at a systems level. Um, I believe Patty and I are going to be doing a session on that later on in this year in Echo Ties. We've been doing a lot of reading and work about how we can be more involved and effective at a systems level and getting involved in those MTSS activities. Okay, I'm going to stop share and we've got a few minutes. I know there's been some rich discussion in the chat. Um, Patty and I've tried to um, answer some, some of the things. We will um, certainly go back and capture the chat and pull down and like the PT competencies and some of those pieces, we will get into the handout um, for today. So you don't have to go back through old documents to um, or old um, ties, echoes to find those that information. But any comments or questions in the, you know, we've got what about five minutes for that. Yvonne, there is a question in the chat that um, perhaps you could uh, talk to. The first is, um, is it okay to just put the recent evaluation in the IEP as its present level? What are your thoughts about that? 
I would, my first reaction would be no, because I think a present level should, maybe if in your evaluation, you've really explicitly talked about um, where that student's needs are impacting their educational program, then I would um, take that piece, certainly. But I've been working really hard <coughs> to um, address within the present levels and a couple of the teams that I've been working with, and I just did an IEP with a team in a school district in our state, where what we really did, instead of just putting all of the OT present levels and the PT present levels and ABA was involved with it as well, present levels under adaptive, we put it throughout the present level. So the student sensory issues were affecting academics. It was affecting um, adaptive. And so OT was in a variety of the different present levels talking about where it was impacting performance. Behavior was. So it was across the, um, the present levels. So just taking the evaluation and putting it in doesn't help make those explicit links of where our um, where what we see as a student need is really impacting their educational program and why our services are necessary, which is what the present levels should do in my mind. And then it helps us track whether they continue to need our services or not. What do you think? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to, what I was going to say. And the other um, comment that I want to make about that is that that helps us talk about our contribution. Um, because if we can demonstrate where our impact is, you know, how our impact is unfolding for students, then, you know, that helps our, you know, our sense of value within the, our own sense of value, but also the sense of value that the rest of the team has in the services when they're tucked away in their own little corner of the world, as opposed to really connected to all of those priority areas for students that occur across the IP, then I think we have a bigger opportunity to really talk about our value in that, in that particular context. And it gets us to, um, as I, as I was talking about, when I was talking about the evaluations, it gets us to a better place where we can say why we are no longer needed. You know, when when we've demonstrated the impact that we had in all of those areas and our service deliveries has reduced that impact, then we it empowers our um, our advocacy for the next steps in that intervention. And I'm, I'm sorry, in that IEP. We have another question um, just about do we create intervention plans for students who are on consult only? I can respond to this one um, pretty explicitly. I do. Um, I write um, intervention plans for all of the services that I'm providing. Again, um, the complexity of it may change um, depending on the complexity of the needs for students, but I do because I feel like it gives me a roadmap and it gives me something that I can use to help really organize and design my intervention for that um, for that student. So that's how I would approach that. Um, Yvonne, do you have any other other comments to that? No, I I agree, and I sorry I was only half listening to you because I was trying to starting to answer the MTSS question. Oh, on okay, that. okay, sorry, but yeah. yes, I I and I think the other advantage is um. If you're trying to make that transition to not having OT or PT goals on the IEP, sometimes you don't have to share your intervention plan, but sometimes sharing the intervention plan, hi Bailey, um, helps to um, be able to um, um, increase confidence that you're still doing things that shows your unique OT or PT goals and then um, eventually um, builds that confidence in moving away from having to have standalone goals on the IEP. I'm, I'm going to just say this. There's this whole question about MTSS. There are some good resources, and I'll try and put put a few in the um, in the chat in the um, handouts for you. I know Echoes Ties has had a couple presentations on this over the years on RTI, and um, so you might want to go look at some of those. And then Puget Sound ESD, which is in Washington State, it's um, by Seattle. So depending on where you're at in Oregon. 
and I, and then I know there's some Washington therapists on here too. Um, it might not be too far of a drive, but they are bringing um, an OTPT team from, I'm going to forget, um, somewhere in the Midwest, I believe, who are doing a lot with MTSS and they are doing a two day um, workshop um, on MTSS and um, it's in October, I, the middle of October. So if you go to Puget Sound ESD's website and if you're able to go there, there's a great um, resource for getting some additional information and it's directly relevant to OTs and PTs. And I just added into the chat uh, a wonderful resource on my side of the country and from North Carolina, um, Lori Ray, for those of you that know her in PT and Bridget Lecomte have done an incredible job on, um, on designing a document to help really support OT and PT resources and, um, and success in MTSS. So 